Okay, um, before we start, the City Council just met on one closed session item and there is nothing to report out at this time. So good evening and thank you for viewing and attending the May 3rd meeting of the Arcata City Council. The City Council meeting is being held as a hybrid meeting with both in-person attendance and teleconference access via Zoom. The first item on our agenda this evening is a land acknowledgement. The city of Arcata acknowledges that the lands we are located on are the unceded ancestral lands of the Wiat tribe. The land that Arcata rests on is known in the Wiat language as Gudini, meaning over in the woods or among the redwoods. Past action by local, state, federal, and federal governments removed the Wiat and other indigenous peoples from their land and threatened to destroy their cultural practices. The city of Arcata acknowledges the Wiat community, their elders, both past and present, as well as future generations. This acknowledgement seeks to aid in dismantling the legacy narratives of settler colonialism. If you would like, please join us for the flag salute. Will the city clerk please call the roll? Mayor Schaefer? Here. Vice Mayor Matthews? Here. Council Member Atkins Salazar? Here. Council Member White? Here. Council Member Stillman? Present. All present. If you wish to make a comment during the meeting, either at the two open public comment periods or for an individual agenda item, there are three ways to do so. If you are here in person, please line up at the podium when the item you would like to speak on is accepting public comment. If you are logged on to Zoom, please click raise your hand when it is time for public comment on the item you wish to speak. Or if you are on your phone, press star nine to raise your hand and it is your turn, you'll be prompted to dial star six on your phone to unmute. For each item, we will take the in-person public comment first and then move to the online comments. We'll not be going back and forth, so if you want to comment, please line up at the podium or raise your electronic hand as soon as comment is requested for the item you wish to speak on. That takes us next to our ceremonial matters. We have four proclamations this evening, um, and the first is a proclamation in recognition of the 30, 31st Annual National Association of Letter Carriers Food Drive Day, which will be Saturday, May 13th, 2023. And this proclamation will be read by Council Member Atkins Salazar. No, oh, sorry. This proclamation will be read by, ah, uh, yes, I remember now, Vice Mayor Matthews. All right, um, the proclamation in recognition of the 31st Annual National Association of Letter Carriers Food Drive Day. Whereas every year on the second Saturday in May, letter carriers across the country collect non-perishable food as part of the nation's largest one-day food drive, distributing the donations to local food banks, such as Food for People, the Food Bank for Humboldt County, and its partner pantries and in individual local communities. And whereas since 1993, the letter carrier's Stamp Out Hunger Food Drive has collected more than 1.9 billion pounds of food nationwide, and in 2022, brought in more than 35.7 million pounds of food in more than 10,000 cities in all 50 states. And whereas more than 34 million people live in hunger every day in America, including more than 9 million children, and whereas Humboldt County letter carriers collected more than 33,000 pounds of food from local community members in 2022, providing critical food resources for Food for People's countrywide network of 18 food pantries, serving more than 16,000 Humboldt County residents of all ages, and whereas the rising cost of living, including gasoline, housing, utilities, and medical care is having a serious impact on low-income children, seniors, and families, particularly those living on fixed incomes, and whereas we recognize all letter carriers for their hard work and their commitment to their communities, and we appreciate community members' support of the food drive. All of the food collected in each community stays in that community. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed that the City Council of the City of Arcata hereby designates Saturday, May 13th, 2023, as National Association of Letter Carriers Food Drive Day, and asks all residents to support the food drive by leaving non-perishable food donation next to their mailbox for their letter carrier to pick up on the Saturday, the second Saturday in May. This is dated May 3rd, 2023, signed by Sarah Schaefer, manager. And it looks like Allison Kenny is going to accept this via Zoom. Well, I would just like to add one thing to that. If you have a P.O. box, you're able to put your canned food within the P.O. box, and they will take that also. All right, Allison, are you there? Hi, thank you. Uh, so we would just like to say that we're so grateful for all of our partners, community members, and especially our 
our hardworking letter carriers? We absolutely could do this food drive without them. Carriers work on the front lines in our communities and get to know the people on their routes. They often see firsthand the struggle of low-income families and seniors, and their compassion and generosity makes a big difference to the people that we serve. Carriers work double duty on the day of the drive, collecting donations while delivering mail, and often work longer hours just to get the job done. We're super grateful to work alongside them. In Humboldt County, more than 1 million pounds collected since 1995 and more than 33,000 pounds were collected last letter carrier's food drive. This is the largest single day countywide food drive of the year and the donations collected in a particular community stay in that community to help local folks in need. The timing of this food drive is also critical as pandemic EBT assistance programs are coming to an end and food costs are on the rise. So many people are having a really tough time putting food on the table. Many of our pantry sites have already distributed donations received during the holidays. 21% of our county's children live at or below the federal poverty level, which means that there's a higher demand for services during the summer months when children are out of school. Last year, we distributed nearly 2 million pounds of food to our friends and neighbors in need. And this year, our most needed food items are protein items like canned soups and stews, canned meat, nut butter, canned fruit and juice, and canned vegetables. And we also request that people avoid donating glass items, expired, rusting, bulging items, or home canned food items. And we also need volunteers. So if you're interested in helping out, definitely check our website out and sign up. Thank you so much. Thank you, Allison. All right, our next proclamation is a proclamation celebrating Water Week, uh, May 1st through 5th, 2023, and this proclamation will be read by Council Member Atkins Salazar. Whereas Water Week is the unique opportunity for both water professionals and the community we serve to join together in recognizing the vital role water plays in our daily lives and Whereas, we are thankful to have easy access to clean water and recognize that many parts of the world struggle with water access and water quality, and that we can help bring education and awareness to these important issues. And whereas, clean, safe drinking water is a finite resource that should be protected and used wisely for the benefit of generations to come. And whereas the City of Arcata's Environmental Services Department serves a key role in treating and distributing our drinking water, delivering public health protection, fire protection, and support for our economy and the quality of life we enjoy. And whereas Arcata's drinking water is safe, refreshing, and meets or exceeds all state and federal drinking water quality standards, and whereas we are all stewards of water resources and the infrastructure upon which future generations depend, helping to protect and conserve our water resources through the wise use of water. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed by the City Council of the City of Arcata that May 1st through the 5th, 2023 is Water Week. The council calls upon all Arcata residents to work together to protect our source waters, practice water conservation, and get involved in local water issues. Please join the city of Arcata as we celebrate the wonder of water. And we have um, our environmental services director, Emily Seacorn here to accept. Thank you. Well, um, I'm honored to accept on behalf of Environmental Services and our Environmental Services staff are real, the real stewards of our water resources and infrastructure um, here at the city. And this week, um, ES staff will be out in the community tabling at the Farmer's Market this Saturday, May 6th, um, with educational resources um, around water and other fun fun goodies. So check that out. And then um, our staff have also um, led a, a student um, poster contest. And those uh, poster contests are due um, on Thursday. But just wanted to share some cool, cool ones so far. So of working with local schools um, with some fun artwork that really gets at um, the importance of water in our community. So thank you. Oh, so Emily, I just wanted to say one thing. When I when I travel and I if I'm traveling with someone local, they always say to me, "Gosh, our water is really good." We are very fortunate. Yes. 
All right. Um, our next proclamations, I'm going to read them both, and I'm going to read them as a set because they kind of go together and they have the same acceptor. But we also we will have a proclamation in recognition of National Nurses Week, which is May 6th through 12th, uh, 2023, and a proclamation in recognition of National Hospital Week, May 7th through 13th. So uh, in recognition of National Nurses Week, whereas one of America's great, greatest national assets is its nurses and the human resources they devote towards a healthy, humane society, and whereas each year thousands of nurses contribute to the health and well-being of their community, and whereas nurses give patients their time, energy, and ability, providing highly skilled, safe, quality care, and whereas it has long been a tradition in our community for nurses to perform work of the highest quality and to care for the health of others. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed by the City Council of the City of Arcata that the week of May 6th through 12th, 2023 is National Nurses Week. The Council encourages all residents to acknowledge the important work done by nurses at Mad River Community Hospital, caring for the community, and to thank them for their dedicated, selfless, and compassionate efforts. Did in May 3rd, 2023, and signed by myself. And then also we will recognize National Hospital Week, May 7th through 13th, whereas the American Hospital Association celebrates May 7th through 13th, 2023 as National Hospital Week with the theme, We Are Healthcare. And whereas this national healthcare event unites hospitals, healthcare workers, and communities from coast to coast, building enthusiasm and pride in giving the nature of care. And whereas nearly 5,000 American hospitals and over 5.5 million dedicated staff members serve as beacons of hope in their communities, and whereas hospitals today are multidimensional facilities encompassing every area of specialization with a focus on wellness and a reach that extends into the communities they serve. And whereas this commemorative celebration demonstrates that hospitals are foundations of the communities that built them and nurture them. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed that the City Council of the City of Arcata, by the City Council of the City of Arcata, that May 7th through 13th is National Hospital Week in Arcata. The Council recognizes the dedication and contributions of the doctors, nurses, technicians, and staff of Mad River Community Hospital and urges all residents to express their appreciation for the people, facilities, and technologies that make the miracle of healthcare possible in our community. Dated today, May 3rd, and signed by myself. Um, is David Neal here? I don't, okay. So we have somebody here to accept. Hi. And so thank you. And I'll just add to that. I'm very appreciative of all Mad River does. And I was raised as a child of like a 40 year Mad River hospital nurse. So I spent many hours wandering the, the grounds in the cafeteria. So thank you guys for all you do. Thank you very much. My name is Tina Wood and I'm the director of nursing at Mad River Community Hospital. And thank you very, very much. Uh, Mad River has served this community for over 50 years, and we're looking forward to the next 50. And on behalf of the nursing staff, thank you. Nurses are there for your first breath and your last. All right, thank you everybody. Um, that takes us now to early oral communications. The council values your comments. This 15 minute period allows people to address the council on matters that are not on the agenda. Please note uh, that pursuant to the Brown Act, the council cannot discuss or take action on items that are not listed on the posted agenda. At the end of all oral communications, the council may respond to statements and supported requests that require council action will be set for future agendas or referred to staff. Speakers will be limited to two minutes, and there will also be time uh, for public comment on each specific agenda item and again at the end of the meeting under item 12. So please make your way to the podium if you are here to comment in person or if you're on Zoom, press uh, raise your hand or press star nine if you're calling in by phone. Two minutes, yes. And uh, all right, take it away. Okay. Hello, um, my name is Joanne McGarry. For those who are seeing me um, at this podium for the first time, I think it's important that people know who I am and what I have to say so they can uh, challenge me or compliment me for whatever I have to say here. But um, as you well know, I like to speak in threes about um, issues and I'm a big believer now in this concept of braiding um, for strength in our community, some of the uh, different issues that we're dealing with. So today I'd like to address zero waste, uh, public transit, 
and the unhoused reality of our town, our CADA. Um, first with zero waste, um, I know we have a new ordinance that went into effect this year on f to go containers. Um, I've been traveling on foot a lot or by bike uh, through town and a lot of food trucks and restaurants. I've um, brought my uh, various uh, to go containers to be filled and um, I've had mixed results in terms of people knowing about it, um, giving me the discount, um, really promoting the concept um, of just even the coffee cup concept of bringing your own cup and I really if we're gonna have an ordinance let's do it seriously and full f full force okay we have a lot of ordinances these days that are not being enforced which is a whole other bailiwick of things to talk about but segueing into that zero waste issue and into public transit I loan out as you all know my green wear um, for various events it will be used hopefully tomorrow at Arcata house partnership for the Arcata chamber mixer and I'm going to take it there by bus because I have an old car that is very unreliable these days and I'm really, really trying to find ways to get around inside Arcata and elsewhere in the, in the greater Humboldt area. Did that go so fast? My God. So anyway, that public transit really needs to improve. I couldn't go to Beachcomber on Sunday. And finally, the unhoused. Um, I'll speak about that at the end of the night. So thank you. Thank you, Joanne. Good evening, Gregory Daggett. Um, the general plan updates from the Planning Commission, uh, there's some big major changes that they're proposing, and that's going from low density to high density for the Sunset, North Town, Bayview areas of town. Um, this is totally unacceptable. I mean, uh, do you realize low density to high density, what we're talking about? High density is a sorrel place next to a single family home. So um, nobody in California is doing this. They're basically, I spent like a, a week in Los Angeles, the beginning of April, went on the Metro lines, um, went through a lot of cities. I read about it. They're basically putting the mid rises all along the Metro lines and also in commercial areas where there's you know a lot of a bus service. So to just be peppering, um, you know, mid-rises throughout our neighborhoods here in Arcata is, is pretty bizarre. You know? And um, I, I don't know where this is coming from, unless it's just we're so desperate for housing, we're gonna do this. But um, you, I would, instead of spending like uh, $6,000 for Ben Noble to show up for a four hour workshop, we should be doing something like have a balloon with some helium and, and start out by going to planning commission's houses and maybe your houses and see what that actually looks like next to your, where you're living. And we also have to think about, you know, the fact from the solar impact, a lot of people are investing in uh, heat pumps and solar panels. They're putting that on their houses. These are not inexpensive things. A 1200 square foot house for a system would be like 40 some thousand dollars. And then we're actually going to change um, low density to high density so somebody could go ahead and do a construction right next to someone's site and and basically take all of their assets away from the, the investment in environmental friendly um, heat pumps so good evening mi sitio web arcata uno punto com Siempre ha uh, estado en español, ahora es más fácil cambiar el idioma. Simplemente arcada uno.com para español o arcada uno.com para SASAP. Uh, todas las palabras están en español. Uh, arcada one.com has always been in Spanish. It's now a little easier to get there. Um, uh, as you know, the Planning Commission had three meetings last week, uh, Saturday, Tuesday, and Thursday. Much good work was done, um, but I'm here to tell you that the schedule is not being able to be held to. I'm saying they're getting about 40 or 50 percent of what needs to be done. This is a schedule for March 1st, um, which is two months ago. I'd say we're about 40 percent on that. Um, every schedule that has been proposed has been overly optimistic. Um, 
had been proposed and then discarded and moved on. Um, in my belief, the council should be prepared to provide an extension to the timelines that are there. Uh, as you also know, on Saturday, the Planning Commission gave explicit, simple, direct, unanimous instructions to David Loya to put an item on the agenda uh, with very specific directions, and he did not do that, uh, which this caused on Thursday a uh, obvious and valid violation of the Brown Act. They wanted to get done what they wanted to get done, but it was not on the agenda. I'll speak to that later this evening. Thanks. All right, it's not seeing any more in-person public comment. We're gonna move to the Zoom room. Do we have any Zoom early oral communications? Um, we do not have any early oral communications online. All right, that will take us now to our consent calendar. All matters on the consent calendar are considered to be routine by the city council and are enacted in one motion. There is no separate discussion of any of these items. If discussion is required, that item is removed from the consent calendar and considered separately. At the end of the reading of the consent calendar, council members or members of the public can request an item be removed for separate discussion. So item A, approve the minutes of the city council meeting of April 5th, 2023. B, by weekly report on disbursements. Item C, approve the project plans and award a construction contract for the Isaacson Sustainable Transportation Infrastructure Improvement Projects to RAO Construction Corp uh, Corporation Incorporated in the amount of $535,197 and authorize the city engineer to increase the contract amount by up to 25%, $133,799.25 for a total amount not to exceed $600 thousand six hundred and six hundred and sixty eight thousand nine hundred and ninety six dollars and twenty five cents and to allow for unforeseen contingencies and authorize the city manager to execute all applicable documents item d to approve a dial a ride funding agreement for the city of arcata for the fiscal year 2023-24 in the amount of eighty nine thousand one hundred and seventy four dollars and to authorize the city manager to execute all applicable documents and item e Adopt resolution number 223-52, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Arcata adopting the Sewer System Management Plan 2023 update per the statewide general waste discharge requirement for sanitary sewer collection facilities and authorize the city staff to certify the document in the California Integrated Water Quality System. So are there any council members that would like to remove an item from the consent calendar? Um, I don't necessarily want to pull item D. I just wanted to recognize personally having somebody in my family blind how important the dial a, uh, dial -a ride program is. That was yes. it. Wonderful. Thank you, dial -a ride for all that you do for our community. Mm -hmm. All right. Any uh, members of the council, staff, or public would like to pull an item? Okay. We will pull the minutes. Item A. Seeing no other items wanting to be pulled. Oh, okay. Speak up. B and C. All right, can we have a motion then for items D and E? Yes, I so move. A second. Okay, with a motion by Council Member Silliman and a second by Council Member White, can we have a vote for items D and E of the consent calendar? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, that carries unanimously and that will move us to item A. So please, let's have your comment on item A. Thank you. Um, good evening. In, in the minutes for the April 5th council meeting, I um, refer to new business item A. It was the timeline for a strategic infill redevelopment program. That's the general plan. Uh, it's on page 16, 17, 18 in the packet. Uh, the minutes for this motion are, quote, the council upheld the timeline set by it at its March 1, 2023 meeting, end quote. This is the problem. It's not clear what the timelines at that March 1st meeting were. In that, the minutes for that meeting, it's not clear what the timeline is. It just says that it's important to stick to them. In the video and the transcription, I've watched this thoroughly. It's also not clear what the timeline is. Specifically, there's no mention in the March 1st meeting by the council members of a timeline for the completion of a draft of the gateway plan, no mention of the timeline for completion of a draft of the general plan. The timeline that was discussed at the March 1st meeting was about the development of the form-based code. Um, we all know the April 5th meeting was about defining a timeline for the completion of a draft of the general plan. The motion was, quote, to uphold the timeline that was set at the March 1st meeting, end quote. 
This is problematic because there wasn't a timeline at that March 1st meeting. It didn't exist. I believe we can all agree what the council wanted to do on March 5th, and I think I would word this as to have a draft of the general plan be ready for view by the city council at their July 11th meeting. If there can be a way to include that in the minutes of the April 5th meeting, uh, or words similar to it, that would provide much greater clarity. I know you can't change the words of the motion, uh, but um, right now it just says the council members express their views regarding the timeline and the general plan update. If that paragraph could be altered to include the actual intent of the council, it'll be a lot more clear. Otherwise, it's completely unclear. The intent of the council is unclear, uh, and it'd be much preferable to have the minutes reflect what the council wanted to do. Thanks. Thank you, Fred. Um, are there any questions or comments from the council or staff on this topic? I, I was, I'm sorry. I was asleep at the wheel. Um, what could we do? How do we um, address that change that Fred suggested to be reflected in the minutes? Well, I, if it wasn't said in that meeting, it can't be reflected in the minutes that way because the minutes are a record of what was said or happened at the meeting. I can't, I can't put in the minutes what your intent was if you don't speak it. And just to be clear, that's a suggestion from a community member, so we are not obligated to do that if we think that the minutes reflect what we were doing in the meeting. Yep, yeah, and I, I think that the timeline was pretty clearly laid out in the meeting and in the packet of the meeting, um, which could be referenced in addition to these um, minutes. So. I'm happy to move forward with motion if, if folks want to do that or if uh, an amendment would like I to be made, let's do it. approval of the minutes uh, of the City Council, April 5th, 2023. I'll second. Okay, so we have a motion by Council Member Stillman and a second by Council Member Atkins Salazar. All in favor? Aye. 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 I'll abstain. Okay, was, ab abstain or a no? You should no or yes. Or Abstain means no. Okay, so we have four yeses and one abstention. All right, so that takes us to item B, which was uh, pulled by a member of the community. Please go ahead. Hi, my name's Joanne McGarry, and um, occasionally and not always, I get a chance to look at the agenda packet for the meeting, and um, I'm not interested right now in singling out any of the items on the cash disbursements listing for the bi-weekly report but I'm wondering as a, a curious and concerned and caring citizen of Arcata how I could find out without interrupting um, a meeting about something I want to know what it represents in terms of the outlay of money um, who and how do I go about that or am I allowed to find that out I'm just trying to know the protocol. Thank you. Go ahead, Karen. Uh, you may feel free to email me, and I'm happy to give you that detail like we did a couple weeks ago. Okay, so direct to the city manager, yep. mm -hmm. not the finance person. It's okay. fine to email to me. Yeah. Pardon? Yeah, email me. Okay. And so that's, you know, I just find it really interesting to see little bits and lots of bits of money, um, and sometimes I'm really curious as to what it's being spent on. So, I would, therefore, I would move for item B, the biweekly report on disbursements. I'll second. All right. We have a motion and a second on item B. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. That takes us to item uh, C. And again, uh, please make your comment. Sure. Um, again, my name is Joanne McGarry, and sometimes when I see a large amount of money for a project, um, I think it's sort of important for me personally to want to have a little bit more explanation about it from just being on a consent calendar. So um, I actually had a conversation with David right before the meeting and I would also um, just like a little bit more specifics about what some of this money is going to be spent on um, in terms of the actual application, not salaries for the employees of the construction company and this and that, but you know, what is happening in the improvement 
plan, just some maybe specific examples because there's sidewalk things that I'm tripping over and um, I was talking about slanted streets and things like that. So I'm just kind of curious. And, and I see Eureka's doing a bollard um, installation in Old Town and I'm just wondering what we're gonna do. Thank you. Um, yeah, David, if you wanna just give us a, a quick, really high level overview of uh, what is going into this project, that would be great, thank you. Sure, um, so this project is kind of a bunch of bicycle, pedestrian, and street improvements throughout the city. The locations vary all over the city, um, but uh, the majority of it, I would say, is probably sidewalk improvements, um, correcting slope in some areas. There's some trips and falls bumps. There's one or two bollards. We're doing some new striping and some portions of the street and intersections where um, the pavement is not in great condition. So we're doing kind of a dig out and a replace that back. So crosswalk areas that, you know, trips and hazards and things like that. Um, I would say that is probably the majority of it. There's also some enhanced uh, pedestrian push button like warning signals that's going on Samoa, um, Samoa and I, and then there's gonna be another set as you cross South I Street um, as well that's gonna be included in this project. Great, thank you, David. All right, um, so hopefully that cleared up some of the parts of the project, and I'm sure um, some of us would be willing to chat more about it offline as well. Um, all right, so that takes us to approving item C on also the consent calendar. I move to approve item C, the project plans and award construction contract for Isaacson Sustainable Transportation Infrastructure Improvement Project to RAO Construction Company. I don't have to read the rest. I can just say move for item C. I will second. All right, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, motion carries unanimously. And that now takes us to new business. Um, so our first item A under new business is to approve an amendment and restatement of the agreement between the city of Arcata and the Humboldt Transit Authority for operations and maintenance of the Arcata and Mad River transit system and vehicles and to authorize the city manager to execute all applicable documents. So we will have a staff report from city engineer Netra Khatri. Okay, uh, good evening, Mayor, <coughs> Council members, uh, members of the public and staff here. Uh, in front of you today is the contract amendment for our annual maintenance contract with Humboldt Transit Authority. Our existing contract with HTA, which is same as the um, Humboldt Transit Authority, was executed originally in 2006 and then amended in 2020, which includes maintenance, fueling, and parking of all our transit vehicles at their yard. This amendment, amendment will add operation services to the existing contract, which includes providing driver services, record keeping, transit data management, and miscellaneous tasks related to the operations. Currently, our transit operates with one transit manager, one transit operator, one three-quarter time bus driver, and five part-time bus drivers. If one of the driver calls in sick, we don't have no backup. Currently, we don't have a transit manager. Transit manager used to be backup driver for our drivers. HTA, which provides transit services to the whole Humboldt County from Trinidad to Garberville and from Arcata to Willow Creek. And also they operate Eureka Transit Services. The goal of this amendment is to provide a reliable transit service to the Arcata residents by using HTA's expertise on transit operation services. This will improve the efficiency of transit service in the area and will open doors for more opportunities in future to add additional routes if funding becomes available. Currently, the, but, um, what we anticipate the amount would be for this contract services is we will be putting in next year's budget and we have funding for that, at least for one year. So this is a one year contract and we'll see how that goes. Uh, we are also working with, as we will be working on this contract. We will not have part-time drivers working for us. So we've been working with HTA staff and they have assured us that they will be taking most of our drivers if they're willing to work and there will be a smooth transition of that. So uh, overall, this is a great plan. I think we've been talking about this for a long time. So now it's in front of you and it's time to execute this. So this will improve the operation services for the whole region. And as I said earlier, if the funding becomes available, HTA has a bigger on driver pool and we could be used the drivers. So now we have drivers, so we need to find money and we find money, then we're gonna add more routes. So Great, thank you, Natra. So, so if it's possible, what I'd like to do, Madam Mayor, is to um, move this item and um, then we can have a discussion on the motion. 
So I, I move for approval of an amendment and a reinstatement of the agreement between the City of Arcata and Humboldt Transit Authority, known as HTA, for operations and maintenance of the Arcata Mad River Transit System, known as the A and M R T S, and vehicles, and authorize the City Manager to execute all applicable documents. All right, we have a motion on the table. Is there a second? <clears throat> I'll second it, and I just wanted to to. Um, add that as our resources are stretched thin, both not only financially, but with personnel, it just makes sense on this and you know possibly other things to take a more regional approach. Um, and I, I think I shared at one of my report outs that I was able to receive or be part of a presentation from HTA showing all the, the new upgrades and, and what they're doing. And it's very exciting and impressive. And so I, I'm happy that we can be part of that. So thank you. Yeah, I'm really excited about it. Um, I'm sorry, there was a motion and a second. So mm -hmm. no, no, all right. You can discuss. So. We can talk about no, it as much as we want. I just think the potential for service is so much higher, and um, I mean, it's what people want: uh, the potential for more routes eventually and better service. So I, I think it's great. Yeah, I'm excited about this, um, and I know that we've been talking about this as a council, and a, a goal of you know just as uh, Councilmember Atkins Salazar said, just improving that kind of regional connection. And um, you know, we see that HTA already operates you know the majority of the buses within the county anyway. And to to come into that system, I think we're entering a already very well established, well run system. Um, the one question that I have, and it might seem kind of basic, but um, how would this change of contract? Um, impact our contracting with Cal Poly Humboldt? I mean, would then they just enter into contract with HTA? And also, how does that, I assume it's kind of the same vein of questioning, but uh, like our free rides that we do in June and July, um, how, how does that impact programs like that that we already um, offer with our bus system? Um, the existing contract that we have with Cal Poly, that will remain in place because that is for three years. Uh, unless HTA gets a new contract with them and then we can get, it, get out of our contract. That's an option. But right now we are planning to have that contract with Cal Poly at least for the next two years and we will be providing services. So we are getting the operation services from HTA. However, we have the ownership of still the, all the buses um, and at least the one staff. Thank you, Natra. And that was my only um, major question. So let's, more questions and comments then we can open it up for public comment. Yeah, just, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, no. oh, I, I just was really happy to hear that there was going to be a smooth transition for the workers that are already here to that. And my understanding is that they'll have access to benefits that they may not have had access, being that it's going to be full time over there. Um, I, I'm sure like I can, we cannot guarantee that at this point. Uh, our drivers are where the part-time drivers, they didn't have benefits with the city. So if they get hired by HTA, if they get a full-time, yes, they will have a benefit. But if they get hired as a part-time, they will not have a benefit. So we cannot guarantee that they will shall receive benefit. But they're not losing anything at this point. No. Right. Thank you. So so I've, I've, I'm happy that we were able to move this forward. And back in the 19, maybe it was 76, um, that was when we had the first uh, bus in Arcata. We had a ribbon cutting for that, and um, there's a picture too. So oh, is it? We'll find that. No, <laughs> is it showing anywhere? I don't see it. But um, but I thought the transition from going there, being the first entity in Humboldt County to have transit, and then to see how transit has evolved over the years in our community, and it seems like it's more than appropriate for us now to join that whole regional system. So I'm, I'm happy that I served on HTA and I was able to bring this forward. So thank you all for supporting it. The, the one thing that I'm a little bit concerned of is when we had local control, we were able to say, um, have bus service on say Oyster Fest or any other like special event and set our own you know, busing. So is that something that's going to be still possible? Uh, yes, that's a part of the contract. We just have to notify HTA in advance, give them at least 30 day notice that we want to have that so we can do that. So that's part of existing uh, this, this amendment. And that'll be, that'll be happening with the Oyster Festival this year. Well, yeah, our, this contract amendment will not be started until July 
one, but our contract, oh, well. existing well, contract, you, yeah. Then so the we'll, cities can operate that, but yes. maybe the following year, HTA will be operating it because that's a request. Okay. <clears throat> Do we have any more uh, questions or comments from the council before we open it up for public comment? All right. Let's hear from the public. Um, we have three minutes on agenda items, and we have a longtime HGA board member and supervisor. Here you go. To talk to us here. Hello. It's got to get reset. Here. There you go. Okay, we're good now. Take good it away. evening, Mayor Schaefer and honorable council members. Uh, I am Mike Wilson, third district supervisor and a longtime member of HTA um, representing the county. I just want to. Uh, help encourage although it seems like this is a positive moment with regards to this this potential transition with relationship to services um, it has been talked about for years it gets brought up every year or so when honestly when we have conflicts with relationship to these uh, special times when there's free rides and all that other stuff that doesn't co it you know we don't necessarily time them correctly together or there's other things that just happen and then we've had issues around um, operationally with relationship to the passes in the past and stuff like that so this will definitely help us move forward with coordination with relationship to that so I think it's not just more reliable service but really more convenient service as well um, so I think that's gonna be really helpful um, uh, and I just want to speak to also we've had the city of Eureka also used to have its own bus service uh, with relationship just like you guys have um, and uh, that I was I have been on HTA long enough to have uh, experienced that transition it's been very positive no one in Eureka is seeking to go back with relationship to that I know that this is really only kind of a first step and sort of a tryout this is just a contract with relationship to sort of the perfunctory and and sort of operational end of things but I will say that um, regionalization is definitely something we want to be more um, uh, moving towards it just helps reduce administrative costs um, and it's true HTA has been extremely successful um, with relationship to grant programs around uh, hydrogen fuel cell buses electric buses those sorts of things and I know you guys got some too and so um, and also just consolidation of the of the um, of the operations with relationship to maintenance and so um, with that I just wanted to be encouraging uh, of this um, movement and I'm just very happy to um, be supportive and you have my commitment uh, to continue that support and make sure that uh, that this relationship is uh, functional and beneficial for the entire community thanks thank you, thank you Mike all right more public comment come on up okay um According to your own data, I think only 3% of the population actually uses the public transportation. So um, my question is, how are you going to encourage more people to use it? Because that's a pretty dismal number. Um, and also, I would say that um, the trustees of Cal State University in the fall when they had Cal Poly, they kind of put them on a spot a little bit because one of the trustees pointed out that he's visited every campus in the state and every question, the first thing that comes out from students is parking, parking, parking. He says, I don't even want to hear it. But it's basically he uh, put Cal Poly on the spot for the Craftsman Mall project because he said there's only about three, uh, one spot per three students. And he told basically um, the president, Cal Poly, this totally unacceptable because he felt that um, sort of it was like abusing the students from the standpoint he said that they come up I visited your campus it's beautiful up there um, you know students want to be able to drive around and see the, the beauty and they also a lot of them live in isolated areas so it's not easy for to use tra the planes to get to them so th from his, their standpoint um, which was totally different than I mean they both work for the state they had different visions of how this was all going to play out um, and I, I, I'm a full supporter of public transportation. I'm not trying to knock it down, but I'm a realistic. When I was in Los Angeles, they spent billions of dollars. They have a subway system, you know, and I, I use that subway system. And there's some real issues going on with that. Um, it hasn't quite worked out with the buses and the subway system because um, not enough people are using it, but also wor worse than that is that there's a lot of, um, you know, safety issues, especially for women too. Um, basically, 
you know, there's a, there's a lot of um, mentally ill people that are on. Uh, there's a lot of homeless issues. There's, there's violence going on. I mean, every day that I traveled for a whole week, there is always an incident um, going on. And um, it's uh, discouraging a lot of people, especially women, too. I mean, it, it was pretty shocking what, what happens to women, what's, what, what was said to them in public transportation. Um, and, you know, even if you're a big guy, you don't really feel too comfortable. I'll just put it that way. So these are all factors that play into it. And I use public transportation when I travel a lot, Miami, New York. The only place I've ever found when I worked in Valencia, Spain for about a year, that system worked and everybody across the board um, from poor to rich used it. But basically here in, in the U.S., it's a very... Um, it's kind of a, like a working class, and it's very difficult to get to your location. A lot of time has to be used. Hi, my name's Joanne McGarry. I'm happy to speak up now, but I really would prefer if Colin Fisk is on Zoom to hear what he has to say first. And I don't know how that... Nope. Okay. I'm, I'm encouraging him to show up in person because um, that would be nice for me. But... Um, if um, I can speak on the public transit issue, I'm all about braiding the different services of public transit regionally, and I think this is a good experiment, like I was talking about in the past, trying these things out to see if they're going to work and make it more beneficial and more effective. Um, I would hope this would also result in uh, Sunday services. Um, like I say, when I was speaking before, I wasn't able to get up to Trinidad like I wanted to on Sunday because there's no bus service on Sunday, and I find that, um, you know, very disheartening. But the other thing about public transit, and I was just reading about the emptiness of the transit center in San Francisco, they're discovering this big fancy Salesforce transit center. Um, it's not getting utilized as much, and it's kind of a, a, a vast wasteland. Um, I had the opportunity to take the bus on Saturday to an AHA event in, on the waterfront in Eureka with my green dishes, and, um, uh, read the schedule wrong and had to wait about an hour and 20 minutes at our transit center for the final southbound bus to come. And I wasn't going to be able to get a, ride, a, a bus back, so I had to make sure I got a car ride back um, from the event. So just these kind of challenges. But while I was sitting at that transit center, I know why a lot of people don't take the bus. Um, I felt okay. I'm getting used to um, the cast of characters that I encounter when I wait for a bus at that transit center, but I think we really need to, as we go regional, Eureka is creating this wonderful um, earth center, whatever they're calling it, down in Old Town, and maybe we can go along and piggyback and create some much um, more visible and effective and um, different location for our transit center here, and again, I'll speak more later about braiding um, services and, and issues together, but um, I think we can use the existing transit center in a different way, or at least temporarily, and maybe try temporarily another bus center in our town. So I'm all for this regional approach. Um, you know, I just hope bus drivers don't have to, you know, drive a bus to Eureka and then drive a car back here at the end of the day, you know, that's all kind of weird. So maybe we later on we could figure out our own system. But um, public transit really needs to improve and it needs to be promoted and people need to use it. And um, that's the future in a climate changing world. So I'm all for um, progressing and moving forward on this particular issue and let's not stop there. Thank you. Okay, that will take us now to Zoom public comment. Are there any public commenters on Zoom for this item? There is no online public mm -hmm. comment. He's not home, no. <laughs> all right, um, with that, that brings us back to the council here then. Um, that's all of our public comments. So we had a motion and a second on the table. If there's no more discussion or questions, uh, we can vote. Or if you have a question, speak now. Well, I was just going to speak up. It's, um, we did have a conversation this morning um, what, how pa the COVID pandemic has affected our ridership and I've been looking at how we are going to be able to start thinking about, well, it'll be an agendized item about w different kinds of ways that we might be able to sort of start to incentivize people 
to, um, but it wasn't on our agenda. So we couldn't really talk about it besides just bring it up and ask that we have something like that on our agenda. So there's a couple of things that'll be coming up in the future and I'll report on those. Thank you, Alex. All right, if there's no more questions or comments, we had a motion and a second on the table. Um, all right, let's do it. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, motion passes unanimously. So for thank you. That contract. Thanks, Mike, for coming. Yes, and thank you to our commenters. Thank you for the support. Uh, we appreciate it. It's nice to be supported. All right, um, that takes us to item B, uh, which is a public hearing to approve the annual engineer's report and declare the city's intention to contribute or to continue to levy and collect assessments of the existing assessment districts, including the Mad River Parkway Business Center, Winsong, and James Creek Meadow Landscape Maintenance Assessment Districts. And we're back with city engineer Natra Khatri. Good evening again. <clears throat> so this item in front of you is our annual public hearing and approval of engineer's report with resolutions for the three existing assessment districts so that city can continue to collect assessment on this district. Currently, we have three districts in the city providing lighting, landscaping, and maintenance services. These assessments are collected so that the staff can continue to provide this kind of services, services uh, consistently. The assessment value for the, each parcels are based on the engineer's estimate and the report that was prepared at the time of creation of assessment. Currently, we have three districts. One is Mad River Parkway Business Center, which is in the Valley West area, that was created in 2013. Since that's a newly created one, it has a CPI increase every year when we do the assessment. Current um, assessment that for the year 23-24 we are estimating is approximately 7,000. And just to give you some stats, in 2022, 2023 is not complete, so we don't have a number. In 2022, we spent approximately um, more than $5,000 at that district. Sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less. Um, it has 10 parcels. Um, when the district started, uh, assessment was not 7,000, it was less than $5,000. So we spent around that amount. The second district is Jane's Creek District, which was created in 2003. Since this is one of the older one, does not have a CPI. The assessment value is always same, which is 16,080. The expense in 2022 was 22,000. So sometimes we do spend more than what is assessed. So that's just a part of doing the business. And you know, we, it's not losing money, but we are just providing better service for that district. That district has 54 parcels. The third one is Winsong Village, which is the oldest one that was created in 1995. That also does not have a CPI increase, has a constant amount of annual assessment of 14,850. In the year 2022, we spent 17,000 on that. So again, that value changes. We spend more money and we get less, but again, we are providing a better customer service for that area. So with that, this is just an overview for you. And if we don't approve this, we will not be having $37,000 coming to our fund and we will not be able to provide the service. So I recommend approving this and moving, uh, putting, including this in the budget and approving the budget. So, Thank you. So if possible, Madam Mayor, I would like to move for approval of this and then we can have discussion from the, the council and public hearing. So I move for approval of the annual engineer's report and declare the city intention to continue to levy and collect assessments of existing assessment districts to include Mad River Park, Business Center, Winsong, and Janes Creek Meadows, Meadows Landscape Maintenance Assessment Districts. I'll second. All right, we have a motion and a second on the table. Um, I'm since sorry, this is can you, can you just amend that motion to uh, adopt the resolutions? Oh, instead of approve? Well, to list the resolutions, there's three resolutions. Oh, I'm sorry. I just read the if, first one. Thank you. Well, I do amend that to make it correct, just for you, Bridget. And I'll still Thank second. You. Thank you. Clerk, is that good enough for you? Okay. Okay. <laughs> They're all, yes, right here. Well, okay. So since this is a public hearing, um, let's open it up for public comment on the assessment districts and maintenance contracts. Um, and then we can bring it back for any clarifying questions or comments that we have up here from the council. Yes, thank you. Uh, my comments are really uh, in the form of uh, questions. Um, the Winsong um, Improvement District dates from 1995, James Creek from 2003, 
they don't have any adjustments for CPI. So the question is, was that normal at that time? And similar question, if an assessment district were made today, such as in the Gateway area, would it have a CPI adjustment for inflation? Uh, to put things in perspective, the Winsong assessment from 1995 is $135 per parcel. Uh, that's the equivalent of $265 today. The total there is $14,850, which would be a little over $29,000 today. Um, and it's uh, doubtful, but can the Winsong and Janes Creek Meadows contracts be renegotiated given the realities of real world costs? Um, I also, while I, I, I fully believe uh, you know, we're doing things efficiently, that in 1995, it was $14,850 from Winsong. How can that money cover the same maintenance uh, today? It involves the play field, the parks, the irrigation system, the draining system, trails, shrubs, lighting. Um, those are just my general questions. I don't expect to get answers tonight, but, but uh, if, if you can do it for that money, my credit to you. But, um, but it's, it's, the assessment is about half of what the cost would be. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Not seeing any other in-person comment. Is there anybody on Zoom that would like to comment on this item? Uh, there is no online public comment about this item. All right. Well, that will bring us back to the uh, council. And, and that was actually, I, I guess I would like to know the factualness behind it, because I know I think there was like some state law that changed with property taxes, right? That has to do with that. So, so why is that uh, CPI not adjustable for those older properties? Uh, these are put in at the time of development. So in essence, it's put in by a vote of the property owners at a certain set point in time. And so it's typically done before any of those parcels are sold and the property owner who's doing the development then controls the vote. And it's part of a negotiation with the city in terms of the development agreements around those subdivisions. Um, to reinstate or to renegotiate would go back to a vote of then all of the parcel owners in those areas. I haven't seen those be successful in other communities. Um, it was fairly typical in that day and age to not add a CPI increase to those. Uh, I've many years ago, it's probably been 10, 12 years ago that um, I looked into this more closely and I saw that there was a period of time where some cities did increase by CPI, just made an assumption that that was, um, but that really is not the case under the laws, how we've read it, so we have never increased those by CPI. Uh, when Mad River Parkway came up and we were negotiating that with the Zanzis, we did negotiate in that CPI increase. Um, so we have played it very conservatively for the council uh, in maintaining these assessments. We were so optimistic in 1995. Um, all right. Well, that answers my question. Any other comments or questions from the council before we head to our motion? Okay. All right. Um, so we had a motion by council member Stillman and a second by Vice Mayor Matthews. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. That motion carries unanimously. Um, and that will take us to item C, which is to approve a summer city council meeting schedule for 2023 and perhaps schedule some study sessions with the Planning Commission. So um, can we have a staff report from City Clerk, Bridget Dory? Thank you, Mayor. Um, since 2008, the council has canceled at least one of its regular summer meetings to uh, accommodate staff and council vacation schedules. So um, this year, you have the opportunity to do that again and also staff needs you to um, schedule study sessions with the Planning Commission sometime between August and December and most likely at least two or more thank you awesome yeah looking at a calendar um, I believe we have a meeting on July 5th which is a weird uh, holiday weekend middle of the week thing so I mean if, if I don't know how people feel about again wanting to yeah well, remove one of these summer meetings if July 5th is is probably the one I assume maybe city so, staff might be traveling um, as well during that time so is the is July 4th a holiday for the city staff yeah. Oh, yeah. it is so how did they put that together 
which way do they go? Do they take it on the 4th or? We take it on the 4th. Okay. So it seems appropriate not to have the 5th as a meeting. I agree. Okay. Uh, I'm fine with that, but I will be gone the first week in August. Okay. I also heard of some August travel from others. So if we're going to be missing a lot of people in August, then maybe we want to think about not having that meeting instead. I'm not going anywhere. I'm, I'm, not, go I'm not going anywhere yeah, that I, I mean, know of. Yeah, I'm going somewhere at the end of June, so I'm fine. But you said you were traveling in August. Are you, Are have you any traveling? opinions on that? I'm not traveling in August. No, I thought Kimberly said she was. It's nice that there's five of us, so we can. Okay. Kimberly's just That's four. Four. All right, well, then I think we should ax July 5th if everybody else agrees with me. Bridget, yeah, I do. Hey, Bridget, how do you suggest we go about setting dates for these um, study sessions? Do you suggest having Rhea send out a doodle poll, or do you want to set them now so we can get them on our calendar so we don't go through seven iterations of doodle polls? Oh, I mean, if you're up for sending them now, we can. If you're up for just saying, please avoid this week or that week, then I'm happy to send out a doodle poll that's maybe a little bit more targeted towards some dates. Um, you know, I'm guessing, you know, if things stay on schedule, hopefully we'll have some level of um, recommendations from the Planning Commission in July. So, you know, a little bit of time to digest and go through, and if they have a little bit of extra work to do, so sometime maybe in August. Yeah, so I would suggest that we all go ahead and maybe hold on our calendars the Thursdays in August, because Tuesdays our planning commission meetings so we don't want to take away from the planning commission meetings but if it's if we can we're on the odd wednesday or wait so wait no because you have an rcea meeting on the second on the third and third to thursday yeah, and i have second. hwma on the second thursday oh, it just gets i think that like maybe if we just kind of generally I, I i think having like ria send out a doodle poll yeah. probably makes more sense but i think if we can decide maybe we say like sometime in the last two weeks of august and sometime in like the first two or the last two weeks of October or something, if we're talking about two separate study sessions. I think that that gives us enough time between the two of them. That gives us, you know, a couple weeks to work with to build into our schedules. And also because, uh, mind you, we have to also accommodate the Planning Commission schedule too, which is, you know, trying to get, what, how many, I can't do math, 12 of us in a room together. That's, that's hard. <laughs> so, so. so that's what we're planning is we're looking at the latter part of August to meet with the Planning Commission on the general plan. Mid, mid to late August, I think sounds pretty good, right, Karen? Does that seem appropriate? Yeah, I would think, and maybe we'll doodle into the beginning of September too, just to, if, you know. So there then, will be one, I think, that, you know, want the entire council for. One might just focus on Gateway. Um, we'll see how that information comes and sort of what the Planning Commission's timing is. But I think if we could just hold a few dates, so maybe we'll just try to hold, you know, yeah. three dates and then and go from there. And if we need to add in an extra gateway one at like the end of September or something just for the three of us, um, that could be beneficial as well. And, and so that means that, um, that in the whole scheme of things that the Planning Commission actually has a little bit longer. Is that how it's going to uh, be thought about? That they have longer to prepare for instead of the 1st of July, maybe they have the 1st of August? I'm just Let's just that up. worry about setting calendars and not talk. I don't think yeah. that we should yeah, talk I'm about optimistic, that. Um, and it could be that there here is the first body of work that we're ready to meet on, and we're still working on you know these couple of bike rack items or element items. But all right, is anything else anybody wants to add, or any huge conflicts, or is that enough information to begin working the schedule out? Maybe staff. That's fine. We need a motion for the July 5th meeting. All right. So if we're going to cancel that July 5th meeting, do we have a motion and a second? I'll make a motion to cancel the July 5th meeting. Okay. I'll second that. Okay. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Do we have public comment? Oh, yeah. We'll take public comment on the summer schedule. Sorry. Is there any public comment on the summer schedule online? Ah, oh, okay. We had a motion and a second. We all voted. Should we vote again? Okay. It was unanimous. So we'll see the third week in July instead. All right. Um, great. So that now takes us to oral and written communications. The city appreciates the public's input, and this time is provided for people to address the council or submit written communications on matters not on the agenda. 
Please know that pursuant to the Brown Act, the council cannot discuss or take actions on items that are not listed on the posted agenda. And at the end of all oral and written communications, the council may respond to statements. Supported requests require council action will be set for a future agenda. Speakers addressing the council will be limited to three minutes. If you're in person, line up at the podium. If you're on Zoom, raise your hand. And if you're on the phone, you can press star nine. Um, all right, here we go. Hello, <clears throat> my name's Joanne McGarry. Um, I carry this around with me now these days to just remind myself um, that we are a small little rural college town on the north coast of California with all the cast of characters um, that, what's that? Oh. <laughs> anyway, um, so the third thing I wanted to talk about when I talked about zero waste and public transit and other ways of getting around town uh, is um, the unhoused and the realities that I am uh, facing in my attempts to get out and walk around or bike around or bus around the community because um, I notice a lot of things because I don't have a smartphone so I'm not looking at it all the time and that's a, an advantage for me in being able to see some other things when some other people can focus um, on that little piece of equipment but I just think um, as I mentioned before, we have a lot of ordinances in place and people are considering new ones, I understand. And I just, you know, why have an ordinance if we're not going to enforce it? But if we're gonna have an ordinance for certain things that um, people need to be called on that they're not abiding by, um, we need to provide a, a reasonable, humane alternative, I think, for some of that. So um, I think this goes back to, um, experimenting with different locations for different activities, for different um, systems in our community, trying different things um, to see if we can't get a handle on things like dogs <laughs> um, in places where they're not supposed to be. Um, and uh, people uh, blowing smoke, whatever kind of smoke it is, um, whether they're not supposed to be blowing it. Um, the one thing I notice is there's a lot of full trash cans all over the place. Um, and that gets back to this whole zero waste ethic that we're not necessarily um, promoting as well as we could. And, you know, I look forward to a day where Arcata doesn't have to rely on trash pickups and trash cans and that people are learning to pack in, pack out, and they're also learning to reduce the amount of trash they generate. Um, I just think that we spend a lot of money and a lot of time doing things that are um, we could do better and they wouldn't need to happen and we wouldn't need to spend money on it. For example, um, there was a cash disbursement and I saw that a check was made to Recology by our um, Arcata House partnership for $24,000. I don't know what the timeline was for that, what it was for, but you know, we really need to get all the different agencies and organizations to work with us on reducing waste and um, enforcing ordinances and housing people. On October 5th, 2022, the city council meeting awarded a con construction contract for the phase one of the Arcata uh, wastewater treatment facilities improvement project for 51,495,000. You also authorized the city engineer to increase the contract amount up to 3,089,000. That's was 6% 6, 6 for a total of 54,584,700. And this was allowed for any unforeseen additional work. This, the cost now is $62 million. So I don't know whether you're aware of that. Um, and if you are aware of that, why aren't you asking the question of how they exceeded that amount. I mean, you, it was pretty generous, the amount that, that you were giving. So you had two bids. The first bid was for 51,495,000. The second bid was 62,888,000. That was the one that you rejected. And also they were threatening to sue, as I recall that, that evening was to spend a lot of time addressing the city attorney. So um, the first bid, according to the engineer, was 30% 30, 30 higher than their estimate. And the second bid was 58% higher 
than what the engineer it, uh, estimated at 62 million eight, 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 eight. So basically, we're, we're at that figure now of the, which was 58% higher than what we expected. So um, for something this important, why isn't you why aren't you getting a report from somebody and staff on why all of a sudden this has gone up quite a bit and i also remember that evening too that a year and a half prior to uh even the even the 51 million um this project was supposedly going to be in the low 30s you uh, know that was what i and i remember stacy she was uh having quite a time dealing with um zoom with you had the second party that was quite upset and then you had the front row with the, the ones that were awarded the contract and, and they basically were, you know, uh, uh, acknowledging, yes, things have gone up and, you know, we're gonna manage this and, and, and tell us why. So my question is, why isn't anybody asking this question? Of, I mean, that's some serious money and this is a serious project phase one. Where, where are we at with this? Um, and also there was a, quite a few um, comments in the North uh, the Journal, I think two weeks ago about this project too. There was a lot of bird watchers that were pretty upset about um, you know vegetation that was being destroyed and stuff. I mean, I, I haven't seen the site, but I'm just saying that there's out there in the community, there was quite a few people that were upset. So um, let's get someone to ask that question. Thank you. Good evening. I'd like to cede my time to Fred Wise. Yes, thank you. Um, variety of items. <clears throat> the, um, the council may or may not be aware that the form based code was scheduled to be delivered last year. Uh, the planning commissioners asked three times in February through May of 2022 uh, for some evidence of the form based code. And David Loya said nothing. And then finally he acknowledged that he had, as he said, tapped the brakes. It wasn't in existence. Didn't, he, had, he had ceased it without any discussion with the planning commission. Um, on April 11th, uh, there was a vote on the Elk and K Street couplet. It was uh, to recognize that the couplet was an option, one of several options. Uh, a motion was made and seconded and then there's a discussion of close to half an hour. During that half an hour, uh, David Loya suggested a different proposal and somehow the motion morphed. I've looked at the transcription, the video, I know what happened, but it morphed from what was perceived as a recommendation, excuse me, from what was perceived as an option, one of several options to a recommendation. Uh, the vote occurred and the commissioner who had seconded the motion retracted his vote and changed his vote. So he recognized that it was a different motion than the original motion. Um, I believe you're aware that the chair of the Transportation Safety Committee, Dave Ryan, is very upset. That the summary of the Transportation Safety Committee was completely mangled by staff in its uh, presentation. Uh, it doesn't reflect at all what the Transportation Safety Committee said. Um, a planning commissioner has requested that uh, Dave Ryan or another SNE from the Transportation Safety Committee should come to the commission directly. Uh, typically, co communication goes through David Loya, but in this case, that's proved to be not accurate. Uh, the same situation has occurred with Economic Development Committee. Their recommendations also were very strongly uh, changed, I'll say. They are not as upset because they believe they're an advisory situation, but Transportation Safety Committee is very involved. Um, on Saturday, I mentioned earlier, uh, the um, commissioners wanted to have an item on the agenda. Uh, first, so that people would know when to come to the meeting. The same proposal for parcel rezoning had been there eight times, as I mentioned. Uh, a commissioner brought this up and uh, twice, and each time David Loy put up an argument against it. Finally, the third time, uh, David Loy referred to the commission and in two minutes, they agreed unanimously that it should be on the agenda, uh, should be prioritized, should be the first thing on the agenda so that members of the public who had been coming to meetings and not being able to speak 
could know when they were going to come to the meetings. Okay? Within 20 seconds, David Loy had changed this to be that he would send an e-notification. I'm not making this up. Okay? It's all in the video. It's in the transcripts. Um, the e-notification went out on Monday uh, with a very strange, what I regard as a very strange subject line. It said, April 27th, 2023, special meeting, outstanding items. I don't think that phrase, outstanding items, has anything to do with parcel rezoning. It means nothing. On Thursday, I, I sent a sharply worded letter, I know, to you on that Monday. And I spoke to the commission on Tuesday saying this needs to be on the agenda. Uh, Thursday came, the agenda was not changed. I received over 30 emails and phone calls on Thursday asking me, what should people do? Should they come to the meeting? What was on the agenda was a circulation element. There was nothing about the rezoning. Um, the, ironically, the rezoning had been on the agenda eight times previously, but it was not on that night when people actually were told to come from that e-notification. Uh, I have an article about this from Nikita One. It's a long article, but you can read two or three minutes of it and get the entire gist of it. The rest of it is just backup for what actually happened. Um, I don't fault the chair. I think he was in a difficult situation and did the best he could, but there is no reason why that was not on the agenda. The um, article has videos, transcriptions, it has the guidelines from the League of California Cities on the Brown Act, and it has case law, many examples of case law that deal with this. Um, the table of items that do not agree with the gateway plan, I've mentioned this earlier, I think has about 5% of the things that have actually come up at committee meetings and in the public. Uh, David Loy refuses to add anything that is against the plan. Um, the, um, in the midst of all this, uh, we had a discussion about rezoning the parcels and staff made one of the parcels wrong. Things are not going well. Um, from my point of view, I think you know how I feel. I think you have a completely out of control community development director who needs to be reined in and you are the people to do it. Feel free to call me. Thank you. All right. Um, that seems to be the end of our in-person public comment. We've checked off the whole room here. All right. Do we have anybody on Zoom wishing to comment this evening we on do. matters not on the agenda? Our first speaker is Jane. Go ahead, Jane. Hi, I'm Jane Woodward, of course, and, and I've spoken to you before and many times at the Planning Commission, and I believe I've sent you uh, a lot of my comments that I have presented to the Planning Commission. Um, and I want to just make a couple of points because I did not prepare for tonight, but I just want to note that one of the things that's been ignored is the Economic Development uh, Committee's point that we need to address parking. And I think we need to think ahead, not just in terms of what our public transportation is going to allow, but the fact that um, we're going to have different forms of, I mean, just like there are little electric uh, bikes now and, and other ways of getting around, we may end up with a whole bunch of little smart cars. Um, HH, Cal Poly Humble is going to put up a parking garage. The point that was made about the number of parking spaces at the um, new facility of Craftsman's Mall is a good point. Um, in fact, nobody's ever talked about how difficult it would be if there were a fire to get all those cars and all those people out of there on what's basically almost just a one-way street, and that needs to be addressed. Um, and I'd like to, as I have before, request that you continue and have a discussion of the implications of the discussion of sea level rise for all further building in the city, because I don't know if you're thinking that it's wise to build five to eight story buildings or five to seven story buildings, even four to seven story buildings, in an area that's going to be subject to sea level rise, whether it's in 20 years, 50 years, or 80 years. And, and whether that's a smart thing to do. You need to look at the cost benefits 
and what liability the city may have for encouraging development in that kind of situation where you know affirmatively what's going to happen over time. And we need to be thinking in terms of what's going to happen to areas like the bottoms, things like that. Where are we going to move people? And where should we be building? And it could be that what we really need to be encouraging is ADUs, not four-story buildings in some of these rezonings. We don't need, if, if we took single family parcels and encourage people to build ADUs or do what they're allowed to do, which if they have the space, they can put two, uh, two houses on that same space plus ADU for each one. That makes four on a single parcel. We should maybe be thinking more along those lines than of putting up four story buildings where like if my neighbor suddenly did this and we had just- Thank you, Jane. That is your three minutes. Solar thing. Thank you. Thank Good you. luck. Our next speaker is Patricia. Go ahead, Patricia. Go ahead. Hello. Patricia. There you go. <laughs> Hello. Thanks. Uh, find the mute, unmute button. Um, so yeah, I'm down in Southern California right now. But um, when I was when I'm talking to the community and collecting signatures for the L Street Linear Park, um, people are overwhelmingly asking for the city to make K Street safer now for pedestrians and cyclists but not at the expense of the L Street corridor. Um, the traffic calming devices, I mean, there's lots of options we have for traffic calming devices along K Street, um, whether it be like raised crosswalks or bulb outs. Um, I'm a big advocate for stop signs. They're cheap um, and they're effective for letting people cross safely. G, H, and J Street for the same length of uh, road that um, the L Street um, would be from Alliance to Samoa. That same stretch, they have all have seven stop signs each. Um, the only calming devices that exist now on K Street for that same um, same uh, stretch is one stop sign and a whole lot of potholes. Um, I don't know if we want to keep the potholes as a uh, calming, calming uh, uh, strategy, but um, so I'm also in Southern California and uh, Santa Barbara and Ventura both closed off their main streets during COVID and they have continued to leave those closed as a walking mall. Um, and so I would suggest it's mainly for the economic benefit. Um, and so I would suggest um, that we keep L Street uh, corridor as a walking mall. Um, there's also another article on Strong Towns about Winter Garden, Florida. There are rails to trails that they, it just economically re revitalized the town and that area tremendously. I would suggest you look up Winter Gardens, Florida on Strong Towns. It's a great article. Um, so yeah, I would just say, you know, uh, we've continued to collect um, signatures. We're over 700 signatures now for the L Street um, linear park to keep that um, corridor open and protect it. Um, and I just would ask you guys to uh, do not derail our trail and keep that corridor open and protected uh, for open spaces and the wetlands and for economic benefit for our city and that area for our, the future growth. So thank you so much for your time um, and have a good night. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Patricia. All right, our next speaker is Jim. Go ahead, Jim. Go ahead, Jim. Can you hear me now? We can. Okay. Um, hello to staff and council. Um, I just wanted to uh, mention I did release an updated petition signatures to planning commissioners as also to staff and council. I hope you all received that and reported with the actual physical petition 695 signatures. Uh, commissioners will be discussing the general plan circulation element on Tuesday, May 9th. At a previous planning commission meeting that was billed as a discussion about the canal couplet, the L Street Linear Park, uh, commissioners took a straw vote to keep the canal couplet as a goal and to seek out grant funding and right of ways for the previous meeting. Uh, the vote was four to two. Um, on a, what I would consider just one vote away from a stalemate. And this inadvertently promoted 
the couplet over the linear park. Um, at their last meeting on land use element, the commissioners voted to keep an agricultural exclusive designation for a parcel that was slated to be up zoned to residential high density, the, the one that's located alliance between 17th and Foster. Um, public pressure and uh, commissioner sediment prevailed. The conversation was about preserving open spaces, specifically ag land. However, the greater conversation was about the limited open spaces in Arcata. There's a continual sediment to preserve open natural spaces in Arcata. The north and south ends of the L Street Rails with Trails Corridor is Greenway and it's valuable open spaces that I think with it being paved over, those will be lost forever. And I think those will be, could be very integral and should be very integral to the linear park. Um, you know, and on that note, I will just read to you one more time the language. We support the existing L Street bicycle pedestrian pathway to be officially designated as a linear park from Alliance Road to Samoa Boulevard. And this linear park be preserved and enhanced as a green space for recreation, play, and community. We also support the spoken recommendation from the chair of Arcata Transportation Safety Committee at its August 2nd meeting, 2022, revise the circulation plan that eliminates L Street as being considered for new streets and car traffic. This area is recommended to become a car-free linear park that prioritizes people. You know, as the open spaces, you know, they rely, uh, the linear park will rely on open spaces in the right of way of the existing railway trail corridor to best serve our caters, caters future infill, greater Humboldt Bay area, and the great Redwood Trail and beyond. And I'll just reiterate one more time, the signers include previous council members and mayors, business members, architects, members of the local Sierra Club, community members of all ages, including Cal Poly students, a broad spectrum of customers visiting the co-op, including out of town visitors, signers from neighborhood and Arcata and around. Online signatures at this point are I have to double check, but I think we're up to close to about 137, you know, and just realize many of these people. Thank you, Jim. That is your three minutes. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, that is the end of our online public comment. All right. Um, that takes us to the end of our public comment period. Thank you everybody for your participation. Um, that'll take us to council and staff reports. Um, yeah. I, I just wanted to see if anybody else um, has had an opportunity to read that article. It was really exciting um, about the economic revitalization. The pictures were um, super awesome. They did this open market where the railroad trails were. And it was exciting because I could almost visualize what that would look like on the L Street Linear Park and the Creamery District. And it would really be sad if we didn't take advantage of that opportunity. Great. Let's all, yeah, thank you for sharing the, the article, Patricia, and hopefully folks will look into it. All right. That takes us to council and staff reports. Um, I feel like I usually look at, to the right and start at this end, so maybe let's start at this end this time. Um, so we'll start, start with you, Alex. Well, I was um, going to say you could start with Kimberly because she already started. Well, no, we're going to go down the line, so I'm okay. going to start with you, Alex. All right. Well, the first thing is that I would like to um, tell you, I went to a broadband meeting today and they were talking about the middle mile and the last mile. And so they're going to be working soon on bringing a broadband, um, it'll, fiber will be in Highway 101. And of course we know 36 is aerial, so it's not in the ground. And um, so there were some interest in dealing with Arcata in the last mile. So I did talk to our um, public works staff about that and so I'll let you know what happens as things move along. The other thing I wanted to ask is, this is um, something, I don't remember this, but could you let me know when we started to, someone could say, I'm, I'm going to concede my time to this next speaker. So you could get maybe 10 people in line and everyone would say that and then the person would have 30 minutes or whatever. When did that start? Pre previously, we've, we've discussed that only one person can cede their time and I think we've kind of set that precedent pretty recently. So okay. one person can cede their time, but not 10 people. Okay, I'm just curious about that. The other thing I was thinking about is the consent calendar and um, I just don't recall this in the past, but maybe it happened. Um, it pulling items off the consent calendar that um, weren't pulled off by the, you know asking the public, do you have anything you wanna take off this consent calendar? 
And uh, I always think that it's appropriate for somebody in the audience that has those kind of questions to be able to call the city manager and get the, the data or the information they actually need. And so I'm wondering if we really want to continue that, do we want to follow some other policies like the Board of Supervisors, other cities, not only in our community but elsewhere, that don't allow the public to pull uh, items off the consent calendar? So I think that's all I have. Thank you. Um, I was not able to attend that broadband, so I'm really excited and happy that you did. Um, hoping that you will share a little bit more in depth. I was looking forward to it, so I'm happy. Um, I was able to attend um, Redwood Regional Economic Development Commission um, as a liaison for the city, and they did the state of Humboldt County's cannabis. Um, it was a really interesting presentation by um, Natalie Delane. Um, if I'm saying Del Thank you. Yeah, not a lindle up. I deleted my mess, my um, notes somehow, so I'm trying to recapture it all. Um, and then also, um, Redeck did also. Um, they pushed forward on the core hub for the offshore uh, offshore wind community benefits. So um, that was um, also very interesting. I attended the homeless housing working group, and there's a lot of. Um, movement going on in there, Arcata House Partnership, I also attended. They completed their extreme weather shelter and there's gonna be a mixer there tomorrow at the Groves Extreme Weather Shelter, so you'll get to see it in all its glory. Looks good. Um, and then Kuna just kicked off our second brainstorming session, or we will be actually on Sunday with Cal Poly Humboldt. Our first one was with the new residents at the Grove. So that's moving right along. Um, oh, and I wanted to let folks know that Arcata House Partnership will be starting a food pantry in light of the recent changes of post-COVID of folks no longer getting that um, extra uh, pandemic um, CalFresh that there's, there's, I'm really concerned about uh, there's going to be less food in our communities. So they're going to be doing that Friday afternoons through September, and it'll be in the afternoon. You don't actually have to be unhoused or low income. You just need to have a need and go and help yourself. There's going to be lots bountiful okay. bounty of food. It's at um, In Valley West at Arcata House Partnership at the Satellite, and um, I believe it's going to be drive through so it should be pretty easy, quick in and out. That's all I got. Awesome. Um, my big things. Uh, exciting in the world of RCEA, we are opening up to the local tribes, and so we also voted to let the Blue Lake Rancheria um, join our JPA as well, um, kind of pending some hammering out from the, the Rancheria on their side, but our board voted unanimously um, to have the Rancheria join as well. Uh, we also celebrated uh, the 20th anniversary of RCEA last Friday, um, which was a wonderful, fun event with a lot of um, speakers throughout the past of RCEA's history. 20 years is um, a long time for a local organization to exist. So um, it was cool to hear their stories and uh, get to chat with some people and also meet some of our new board members because we've both added the Yurok Tribe and the Blue Lake Rancheria to our JPA pretty recently. So. Um, that's all exciting, and I'm on the budget subcommittee, and I get to go learn about RCA's budget, and I'm so excited. Um, and then just continuing work as well with Equity Arcata. They had a successful Home Away From Home event, and there will be another one coming up here in May. I don't remember the exact date, May 20-something. Karen, if you have it on your head. Oh, it's this week. Okay. Never mind. Yeah, because I saw the sign up for, for donations um, into the city manager office. Uh, it'll be at D Street Community Center. Um, we'll get a date on it, but the home away from home events and the last one was at Wildberries and was enormously uh, successful and so they're hoping to get even more students to come to the event um, with it being a little bit closer to campus there at D Street. So um, yeah, and Oyster Fest is June 10th. Don't forget. Well, Kimberly took mine, but yeah, there's a chamber mixer on Thursday at the Grove. Um, also, May is Mental Health Month, so Take care of yourselves, take care of others. And it's almost crab season. I can't wait to see the new scoreboard lit up. I'm really excited to go crabs go. At um, HCOG this month, we had a presentation about the Great Redwood Trail. And um, just before I get into that, just in general, I have asked more than one time because um, often, you know, we've been hearing um, 
trails to rails and that is really not how we do things in Arcata and I've double checked many times and we, we will keep our trails one way or the other, including the Great Wedwood Trail. And um, they have some upcoming events where, which um, have opportunities for the public to engage and participate in. Um, some of those, would, one of them is at the Eureka Fourth of July um, Festival for Tuna Rodeo and Humboldt County Fair. And um, they believe the draft plan will be submitted to the public around January of 2024. So now is like a good time to weigh in. Um, the economic benefits to Humboldt County alone um, are about when it's built out and functioning, $48 million um, to our three counties that it's running through, Mendo, Trinity, and Humboldt, over $102 million. So it'll be a great economic driver for our communities. And um, Steve, uh, Supervisor Madrone is vice chair of the Great Redwood Trail Committee, so if folks want more information, they can contact him. And also May is Bike Month. Um, we, there's lots of events, so um, try to participate. Yeah, I saw, gosh, see, I wish I wrote down these dates, but if you go on the Instagram for Bike Month, they have a ton of posts, but they're doing a morning. If you're on your bike and you're biking to work um, at the co-op in Arcata, they're going to be like free bike tune-ups from Adventure's Edge. You can get free coffee and like baked goods from the co-op and just learn more about bike safety and biking to work. Also, um, and the, the city is helping host the bike rodeo that's um, coming up this month as well. So if you check out the bike month Instagram um, or I think they just have a regular website as well. Um, it has all of those dates of these upcoming fun events. So thank you for that reminder, Stacey. All right. Um, with that, oh, my gavel's not out. Uh, we are adjourned. Thank you, everybody.